Welcome to Mindless Entertainment. My name is Jesse Milestone, and today is the most exciting thing that has ever happened on this channel. Uh, with the click of a button in just a moment, I'm going to bring onto this video uh, one of the most important people in my life, arguably, uh, because he is one of the people instrumental in creating Star Wars, as in the Star Wars, that one that came out in 1977 and changed movies forever. Uh, so without further ado, guys, uh, the one, the only Academy Award winning editor, Richard Chu, is here today on Mindless Entertainment. Holy cow. Welcome, Richard. Welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really uh, a thrill, you know, for being asked questions about something that happened, what, uh, 47 years ago, whatever it was. But it was a long time ago. An exercise in memory, some might argue as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm glad you're catching me before I lose any of my memory, you know? I'm not going to pretend that wasn't one of the impetuses of going, you know, people don't live forever. I probably, if this is a thing I'm going to do, I probably shouldn't wait another decade before giving Richard a call. Not suggesting that you don't have another decade or three in you, but, you know... You get to a point in your life where talking about your past just seems pointless because chewing your food seems more imperative. <laughs> well, you know, um, when people ask me about my past work, I, I'm just so glad to have the opportunity to be able to, to talk about it because um, I've learned so many things along this journey that I've taken because it wasn't something that um, was predictable from the beginning of my life. So uh, just the fact that I've participated in the making of some uh, memorable work, I, it's a thrill to be able to talk about because perhaps what I share um, could be used by people in your audience who have aspirations of their own and maybe they can apply some of that. I am a big proponent of, you know, do stuff, show other people what you do. And that's usually the best way to teach and to give back to the world. You know, just do the things that for you are right. And hopefully other people figure it out as well. Uh, but right. as you mentioned, you did not come into this traditionally. And I think that's a really, like you said, you know, it's a great opportunity for other people to hear and maybe get that earworm and go, oh, maybe I could be an editor. Maybe I could be a filmmaker. Uh, before we dive into that story, I will, I figure I should let you guys know how we came to be here today. Because I'm sure the audience is still scratching their head as to, Jesse's, she's got like, not even 30,000 subscribers. How, how'd you get this guy to come on her? Yeah, I've been scratching my head too. So we should probably go, go into the backstory, uh, which is to say, you know, talking about the past can be a very powerful tool. I've been doing it since I saw Star Wars as a kid. And I've been talking about it pretty much religiously and repeatedly as all of my audience, most of my friends and my family certainly knows, uh, you know, since I saw it, God, at this point, 25 years ago, which still, you know, barely more than half the life that the movie has had and time to influence that many more people in the world. But I digress. So I'm in college, right? And I'm in this, taking this incredible class uh, at Bennington. We have visiting professors coming in left and right. And this woman comes in, Julie Talon, uh, and to teach the moving image history of the 1970s. And before even taking this class, some of my favorite films were already had already come out of that, that era. I was already a huge fan of movies like Jaws, The Godfather, Alien, and of course, Star Wars. Um, goes without saying. So I jumped on this one and had a, a blast of a time. And then it came towards the end and we had to write, we had to do a presentation, write a paper, do a presentation on, on something, uh, some big thesis, you know, encompassing the decade or, or something we learned or gleaned from that class that had changed our perspective. And I thought of all these fun ideas from all these crazy, wacky new things I had learned. And then at the end of the day, I came circled back around to this one thing. And I said, Jesse, don't kid yourself. There's only one topic of all these great movies you've watched, of all these great things you've learned. There's only one topic you really want to, to talk about. And that's Star Wars. So I went to Julie and I said, I'm gonna do my paper on Star Wars. And she said, cool. So uh, do you know who Richard Chu is? He was this, you know, he's one of the editors and uh, he's someone I knew from, you know, my filmmaking days. And uh, here's his number. Why don't you give him a call? Let him know. And uh, I'm sure he'd be down to give you a little interview for your paper. So here I am far out of my depths, uh, you know, in this situation, uh, <laughs> making this cold call, having this incredible uh, uh, interview. You gave me so much of your time back then uh, and, and gave me so many nuggets that, to this day, I've been walking around 
telling my friends, oh, this time that I talked to Richard Chu and he told me this thing about Star Wars. So, you know, fast forward almost a decade out of co- uh, a decade later, you know, out of college, all of that. And um, and realizing I still have your number and realizing I called you once. So it doesn't feel that weird to do it again. Maybe you'll say yes. The worst you're going to do is not answer. And here we are. So, <laughs> uh, but again, your journey was even more meandering. So where were you when you decided uh, that you wanted to be an editor? If you want to take us back even further, feel free. Where does your journey start that ultimately leads to where we are now? Well, I like to uh, begin telling my story that's well, I guess I, I, I was in law school. I was, um, well, let me even go back before that because I didn't even know what an editor was. You know, I never heard of that term because as a kid growing up watching movies, it was just uh, a bunch of shadows on a screen, shadows and light on the screen. And I never thought about uh, that there were people that created these images and the story that went behind that. So I never had given you know movies a thought because I grew up in inner city LA, and um, you know it, it was being a, a child of an immigrant family or immigrant parents. Um, it was uh, you know um, we get a good education. So I, I ended up in law school, and I realized once I was there, even though I had been a good student growing up, you know in, in public schools, that when I ended up at Harvard Law School. Um, I realized I didn't belong there. You know, I, it was one of these, it's almost like the kind of nightmare that you, some people have, you, you wake up and you wonder like, you know, it, it's like in a, um, a, a Spike Jones movie, you know, you end up and the ceiling is too low. Or, I don't know, you're in somebody's ear or something. Yeah. And anyway, I, I found that when I was sitting there in the classroom, and there, I mean, all these people talking about things that I could not care about, one. <laughs> and maybe because I didn't understand what they were talking about. But, you know, it wasn't anything. I mean, and then you had to read so much every night outside of the classroom. And it had to do with nothing that I cared about. And um, so, uh, of course, you know, what do uh, students do when you're unhappy is you go to the movies. So uh, in Cambridge, there was uh, an art theater, and I saw this movie, and this was in like 19, I hate to tell you this, it was back in 1965. I, had, I went and saw a film, an independent film called Nothing But a Man. And it was in black and white, and it was made a few years prior to that. And what impressed me about it was, it was the first film that I had seen, and it was about an African-American couple uh, in courtship, uh, and it took place in the South. And, you know, when I was watching this, this was in the height of the civil rights movement. And um, I had never seen a, a, a film, that, a dramatic film, a fiction film, it wasn't a documentary, and it was just about uh, the courtship between this man and this woman uh, and the woman's uh, father, who was a town preacher, uh, very middle class guy, uh, objected to the fact that his daughter, that he wanted to marry, you know, someone outstanding in their community, was being courted by a, a railroad worker. And so it, it was like about class conflict. And oh, and, and besides that, the guy was a single father because uh, his. The, the mother of his child had died of drug addiction. So there were all these um, interpersonal problems that it was kind of treated in a very, not a judgmental way. It was just a, kind of a laying out of the lives of these people. And it so impressed me that it wasn't an entertainment vehicle because I think that some, or that's not that summer, but during that time that I saw this, the big movies were like uh, Sound of Music, and mm. which is not my cup of tea at all. But there are like spectacular Hollywood, you know, pictures in Technicolor. Yeah. And when I saw Nothing But a Man, it impressed me that, you know, whoever did this, I want to learn how to do this. Because I think it's, it's telling a story, one, of people that are considered the other, those people. 
And because I'm part of that community is those people, I thought that I want to um, learn how to tell stories more about those people among them you know, myself, but um, how do I do that? So I went to New York and I, I found out, um, looked up these uh, two uh, guys that had written and directed this film. And it was the beginning then of my journey where they uh, introduced me to some people out in Seattle uh, that uh, were making documentary films doing kind of a hotbed of uh, student activism and community yeah. activism. So I quit law school without even thinking about the consequences of that. Uh, these people, um, uh, Mike Romer and Bob Young, uh, in particular Bob Young, uh, introduced me to uh, this uh, television company in Seattle that uh, gave me a job in television news when it was the first time I picked up a movie camera, a 16 millimeter camera, and it was spring wound. And those the same kind of cameras that combat veterans used in the war, the Korean War, the Second World War. There were 100 foot loads of 16 millimeter film, and you would wind the, the, the spring on the camera that would then drive the film, you know, through the camera. So and it was, the camera was handheld and it was on a turret. And the turret had three lenses, a 10 millimeter, a 25 millimeter, and I believe a 50 millimeter lens. Wow. And then if you want to change focal lengths, you stop the camera and then you, you, you turn the uh, turret um, for the lens uh, that you want to use. Anyway, that was my introduction um, to film. It was shooting 60 millimeter film, newsreel stuff. And that eventually led me to a few months later, I was able then to transfer to the division of the company that was making documentary films. And that was so exciting for me. This is at the end of 1966, the beginning of 1967. And by this time, um, this uh, group of young filmmakers who were all a little older than me, but had all gone to film school, uh, they were making films about uh, um, farm workers striking in the Salinas Valley in California, which was a big thing at the time because Cesar Chavez was leading a, uh, a union of uh, farm workers that were uh, advocating a boycott of the grape industry because of uh, farm conditions or, or conditions for the farm workers. Wow. So uh, that and, and the same group of people uh, were making documentaries about uh, anti-napalm demonstrations because this was at the height of the Vietnam War, where uh, Redwood City in California was uh, one of the headquarters of the Dow Chemical Company that uh, was making uh, napalm bombs. Mm -hmm. So I started um, getting my political education and my cinema cinematic education by this group of young filmmakers uh, in Seattle. And it was just so exciting that not only was I learning new skills that led toward, uh, you know, picking up skills about telling uh, stories on film, but it also had a political orientation that uh, kind of pulled me right in because it was part of the things that I felt, but I never found articulation before. Yeah. So, got me started was uh, I got into then working in documentary films so that in within a year I left um, law school I withdrew in the spring of 1966. Now I want to interject really quick because you haven't yet said you haven't yeah. mentioned where you left law school from. Oh where, oh I was you mean at Harvard Law School in Cambridge. Yeah, so, so you, you had you had yet to mention that it was Harvard that you were at for law school, which, you know, has a certain reputation in law. And I, I wanted to stop and, you know, on that point for a sec, because that's to me, I mean, that's 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 not a lot of people have the courage to do that at any point, you know, to leave that kind of path and that great of a trajectory. I mean, people would yeah, everyone will tell you that is exactly that is the top of the line where you're going for law and to have the courage to say, that's not what I want. And to realize there was something more important calling uh, to you and those stories that you wanted to tell and to go follow that. I, I love that. I love that so much because that's, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying everyone go leave school, quit school, drop out. But when you find something that speaks to you or when you realize you're someplace 
with and doing things that don't stop stop doing those things and and find the things that speak to you because you will always do so much more good and so much just more and then be more fulfilled uh i mean obviously i can't speak for you but i'm guessing that you're happier with the editing decision than the law school one anyway i just wanted to make sure people realized you know is you just leave law school and you know in somewhere in california you went out to harvard for law school and then said nah no thanks i'm gonna go back out to the middle of nowhere to run around the woods and make documentaries that are important about important stories that need to be told. So please continue. I just wanted to make sure people. Oh, yeah. really understand that. I mean, you know, I mean, a little of that backstory is that, you know, uh, my parents uh, immigrated from China, like actually a century ago. I mean, when I look back at it now and they were in their twenties and actually my father had uh, come to California when he was uh, 15 years old. And I, I mean, it shows you kind of how different my whole family family is, is because of this upbringing my dad had after he arrived in California, because he was raised, he was taken into a family, uh, Reginaldo Del Valle, Reginaldo Del Valle, who was a Mexican uh, heritage, you know, he had roots in Mexico, but he was really a Californian and he was a, a young politician. And uh, he and his uh, wife, uh, took with my dad and was responsible for making sure he went to public school, learned English, and kind of got acculturated and introduced to America. Uh, because my father, when he arrived, like most immigrants, didn't have any knowledge of English. So anyway, you know, for my father and my mother to come here and then raise a family of five, and I was the last one, um, they had great ex. Um, expectations of me. And, um, you know, my mom died by the time I, you know, got into law school. But my dad, of course, was so excited that I could become part of the establishment. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche when uh, we hear uh, children of uh, immigrant parents who say, well, I want my uh, children to be either a doctor, a lawyer, or an accountant, or a pharmacist or something. And uh, so when I got into uh, Harvard Law School, my dad thought, oh, man, you know, this is exactly why, you know, I raised this family was, you know, for one of my children to, to do this because he's going to obviously you know, do great things. And it was a huge disappointment, you know, for him, uh, you know, that I did this because not only did I drop out of law school and went into film, I became a hippie. <laughs> you know, so, you know, my dad, I didn't have the nerve to go home to see my dad for a couple of years. Yeah. And by the time I went to see him, of course, I had really long, longish hair and I was wearing tie dye t-shirts and combat jackets and cowboy boots and not looking like the nice, you know, Chinese boy that he had raised. So, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, I guess what I'm saying is you got to follow your heart. Yeah. I mean, in the end, in the end, jokes on him because it's part of the establishment. Hell, you're a part of American history. So yeah, exactly. You can't, <laughs> you cannot predict what's going to happen, you know? And I think I, I mean, even not just star Wars itself, but some of the other work that, uh, you know, that I've done, it's influence, I think, infinitely more people than if I had gone into, I don't know, a state law or, or a tax law or something like that. I yeah. Mean, you know, what differences are made for most people? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thinking about that time working on documentaries, what are some of the the big take? What are some of the things that you were that really struck you about that period of time that really, you know, were special about working on those documentaries? Well, um, you know, the, the, in the 60s, when I started working in documentaries, um, the prevailing kind of new aesthetic was cinema verite. Oh. Uh, because prior to that, I mean, um, documentaries were really kind of more like NBC white paper. You know, they were like um, controlled by uh, uh, narrated scripts that had been uh, written and then the, the team would go out in the field and film the images that were pre-written. Whereas the new aesthetic that especially came from France uh, yep. by Chris Mahir, who um, was, my French is really good as my kid, uh, was a cinema verite, which means you're just capturing 
you know, what's going on. Uh, Frederick Weissman, you know, is the prime kind of actor, not actor, but the prime documentarian who yep. has carried that um, aesthetic through for decades now. This, basically, he just has the camera running and just lets all the people in the uh, uh, documentary to speak for themselves with no narration. Um, the Frank different from say Earl Morris and Earl yeah. Morris, you know, stages stuff mm -hmm. and he, you know, he lights, you know, the scene like in Fog of War, he would just light McNamara, you know, and, and everything is on a stage and he asks pointed questions and he directs, you know, the direction of the subject matter being discussed. So the cinema verite uh, method that I was enamored with, and of course, it, it takes a lot of confidence that you can capture all of this. And that was, you know, uh, the school that yeah. I was kind of indoctrinated with, that that was the aesthetic, that you just turn the camera on and you follow what's going on. Yeah. And uh, to me, that was what I was trying to do in that film for the Peace Corps that yeah. was called The Fighters, as opposed to The Redwoods, which was yeah. something of capturing images that were locked down um, with the camera locked down on the tripod. And it was kind of scripted in the way that, well, you catch it at dawn, you catch it at sunset, and you do all these uh, things as a, in the outline. And the cinema verite stuff, like in the film for the Peace Corps, it's not really outline. You just go and kind of follow what um, the principals are doing. So, yeah. you know, I, I had to un, what, unlearn some of that stuff later on. Yeah. At the, at the same time, though, the cinema verite, verite style um, is probably, you know, is really what what gives you those tools as the editor to craft your own narrative in a big way, which I'm sure, you know, gave you a leg up on some of the other ed editors getting into the room going, OK, I cut the piece to the story and the picture that the script says. And you're sitting there going, well, how do I change? How do I make the story better? How do I, you know, how do I change things around or, or, and, and really, and really knowing viscerally in a way that other people in the room probably didn't just how much you can influence the narrative uh, by telling that. That's really, that's really fascinating. I, I actually remember learning all about cinema verite in college for the first time. And uh, what do you think it was about that time? Um, Cause as you, as you mentioned, cinema verite really was started in France and then, but I mean, there were movies, I mean, the Maisel's brothers were the, uh, you know, huge. The, the American, yeah, the American, yeah. And you know, like Grey just, Gardens famously and, and, and a lot of their work. What, what was it about the time and the climate? Do you think that, that captured people's attention with cinema verite over the more traditional. Well, I think the 60s, yeah, the, the 60s was such a time of liberation, you know, not only in social movements or in political thinking, you know, but uh, also in the aesthetics of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you know, for me, kind of the greatest uh, periods of, of uh, American films was in the 70s. And I think it grew out of the momentum in the 60s where mm -hmm. you, know, um, you began to question a lot of the aesthetic or the, the theories behind the time. And and this is the time when, you know, people like the Lucases and the Coppolas and the Scorseses, they were just coming out of film school, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think the film schools at that time also was, um, you know, realizing that we had to <clears throat> change the aesthetics. Uh, of our, our approach to uh, storytelling. Yeah. So oh, within, yeah. after dropping out of law school, um, within a year after that, I um, got selected in this company to be the cameraman to go into the Redwoods in Northern California to shoot a film for the Sierra Club. Um, because at that time in 1967, uh, what was controversial was to uh, preserve this grove of virgin redwoods uh, to nationalize it. And the Sierra Club uh, wanted to have a tool, uh, a documentary film that they could use to lobby Congress to nationalize this grove of virgin redwoods. So uh, I became this uh, part of this crew of three that went and spent a month and a half in the, in the woods. So, you know, I mean, 
it was such a thrill. I mean, I had no idea that after leaving law school that I would end up having this chance to do this. You know, at, uh, at dawn, you know, at five in the morning when the fog is rolling in through the redwoods because th this is right by the ocean and, and the fog would roll in and it start revealing the, the sunlight coming through from behind me because, you know, I was facing west and this light was coming in behind me and it would then expose um, these trees, you know, as, as the fog receded. I, it was just, you know, it was so much better than being in, in a law office. Um, or in the courtroom or anything like that. And I just, um, you know, it, anyway, it was a great experience. And then from that, um, a year, uh, oh, and that uh, film, as it turned out, led me to editing because I got to be able to be exposed to actually rearranging the images that I had, you know, captured on film. And this is all you know, on 60 millimeter film. And then, uh, uh, and as it turns out, that film won uh, an Oscar for best short documentary of that year. And then, um, and I wasn't even around to uh, be with the producer to accept that because I was in the jungles in um, the Andes in uh, Colombia, uh, uh, being a cameraman for a film for the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, within, that was like two years after I had dropped out of law school. So, I, I mean, I just couldn't imagine being able to explain to anybody that that's where uh, my life would lead me to, that then I'm shooting a film for the Peace Corps now. With, <laughs> you know, these Peace Corps volunteers who were mostly kind of activists from the East Coast, you know, like they had foreign teachers unions and garment worker unions. They were American Peace Corps volunteers uh, at that time. They were activists, not like today, you know. Um, Actually, I don't even know keyboard what warriors. <laughs> no they were uh, politicizing um, Colombian kind of campesinos um, to uh, petition their own local government to uh, do something, you know, that would benefit uh, the local community. So I began to learn about how politics worked on a grassroots uh, level. And I was capturing that on this film, you know, marching in to uh, following these uh, petitioners uh, into governmental offices. And it was, I don't know, I mean, it was just a thrilling time for yeah. me as being a young person, uh, you know, because you can hide behind the camera in a way, you know, and it makes you immune, even though, I mean, I remember this one scene where we're uh, going with these um, uh, 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 villagers uh, that wanted just to have sewers you know, installed in their village because the floods, we've been washed out all the sewage all over. But, you know, I, I was just having the camera behind them, uh, this delegation of campesinos, and just going into government offices. And because I had a camera and the producer was holding lights that um, the cops or the soldiers that were guarding the doors would just open up the doors for us because the camera meant something that made us <laughs> into this. So, you know, we were able just to walk right in and the minister of the interior of the, that region, you know, was in the middle of the meeting and he would look up and he would see the camera on. He would start to smile and would welcome this delegation where I know they, he would have kicked them out if they didn't have cameras with him. Oh, so yeah. oh, look at what you have there. Here's, well, yeah, here's that's, that's coming in. Too. His name is Lando, as in from Star Wars. Lando? Lando, um, like Lando Calrissian, well, Lando Calrissian, oh, his, oh, older, his older brother's Han Solo. So <laughs> the little ones are named after, I have four cats all total. The little ones are named after characters from Firefly, the TV show. So we keep it on brand. Mm, yes, jolly buddy. He just likes to be part of things. I wanted to ask on the topics of, of, of these types of films, especially with something like the Peace Corps one, obviously I would assume the Redwoods, you know, since it's sort of has an agenda behind it, there's a little more of a narrative that comes with it. But for something like going down with the Peace Corps, some of these other documentary projects, what, how much of a narrative do you go in with? I mean, cause that's obviously when you go to shoot a, 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 a written something off of a script, you know, your shot list ahead of time with documentary, it's completely different beast. You don't know what's going to happen. So you can't outside of interviews and whatnot, you can't really plan your shot list. 
So when you went into these projects, how well did you guys know the story you were telling versus how much of it unfolded or, you know, a combination thereof, you went in to tell one thing and then that changed completely when you got, when you got there. Oh, exactly. Um, you, you, you know, we knew what the intention was, but we didn't know what the actors would do. I mean, not actors, but the people who were, you know, occupying their various roles in the drama. And uh, we just had to be quick on our feet. I guess my six months uh, being a news cameraman, you know, prepared me for that. Mm -hmm. um, but now I had a different tool. I, uh, the cameras then that documentarians use uh, were a 16 millimeter uh, eclairs. And it's a French camera that um, uh, where it, uh, you mount it on your shoulder, the, the magazine that holds a, a 400 foot load, which is 11 minutes of uh, 60 millimeter film. Um, you hold that on your shoulder and it's about 20 pounds and then you would have an, uh, usually a zoom lens, uh, a 12 to 120 millimeter zoom lens uh, in front of you and that's what you're shooting. Yeah. And, um, but you know, I, I had no idea how this would inform me later as an editor in, in feature films or in dramatic films because all I was trying to do was to capture film and follow the action because you never know who's going to speak next who's the important person yeah in the particular scene or this particular environment yeah and um it was always a struggle and and you see this in other documentary films mm -hmm. that the style has changed now but at that time i was just trying to capture the person who's speaking yeah so if you have two or three people in a room or an environment uh, or talking, I'm constantly kind of behind, you know, I'm, I'm like on this person and then someone else is speaking and I'll pan over there and, he's <laughs> speaking and I'm just going back and forth. And it took me a while to learn, like, you know, pick your character and stay with your character and get the reactions, you know, because, and I especially learned that when I uh, was uh, uh, editing this stuff later mm -hmm. to realize like, wait a second, <laughs> I don't have any footage of the reactions of who is speaking to what and all that because I'm, the camera is always behind, you know, the action. So um, I'll speak with this later about, you know, when I worked on Cuckoo's Nest and all these other films about how to use reactions. But at the time I was working in documentaries, the, the, the goal was, you know, you, you want to get on camera the person who's speaking. I, I actually have to say, learning about editing helped me be a better camera person for exactly the reason you said. You know, when you have to edit your own work or edit someone else's any work and you sit down and you realize, I don't have all of these shots, you suddenly realize what's important to see on the camera. And that, you know, even for even for narrative filmmaking is the same thing. You know, there's you suddenly get into you're telling your story and you realize there's so many more pieces to the story you didn't capture. And if you don't have that footage there's nothing you can do about it in the on the backside so editing really helped i i always say with filmmaking you know everyone should pick the thing that is your thing because it really is a, a collaboration of a lot of moving parts but it's so important to learn every piece of it as an actor even learning filmmaking has helped and a lot of directors talk about taking acting classes to inform that process because of that nature of the different cogs you know learning what someone else's job is helps you be better at yours because they're have just as important. They have just as important a role towards the finished product as you do. If you can do your job in a way that helps them out, the product that you're both working towards just gets better. I love that. Like it's such a, it's such a weird feedback loop. That's so specific to filmmaking. I think that's one of the things that I love about it. Well, you know, I did not go to film school. If I had gone to film school, I probably would have learned these principles early on. Yeah, but that's the thing. I went to film school. You learn all these principles. You still go out and make all of the mistakes for yourself <laughs> right. before you figure right. it out. <laughs> right. Right. Well, the world, the world is the film school for me, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I'm a better teacher. So I guess the point that I um, wanted to make was how little did I know and what little expectation I had of what the world would teach me as I journeyed further down this road of filmmaking because I did not have goals of um, going to Hollywood 
in whatever that is, but certainly um, I didn't have goals to work in dramatic film. I just wanted to make, um, you know, a, a documentary films that would expose the world to uh, injustice or to inequities somewhere or to give voice to people that weren't represented on film. And I thought that was kind of modest, you know, in a way. It wasn't about making uh, work that would make a lot of money for a studio. Yeah. Well, you know, certainly I'm, I'm kind of like um, pretty down low on the totem pole in the, in the decision-making process about what, um, you know, uh, subjects get to be filmed or get focused on. And certainly it was modest at that time. This is why I thought, you know, documentaries was really the area for me because we knew we had a smaller audience and our goals were modest. I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't have um, an eye toward uh, working in uh, studio features that had, you know, wider goals to reach wider audiences. So, yeah. you know, I just thought um, at that time that if we want to give a voice to yeah. people, I mean, it's going to have a limited audience, usually for, you know, just to see the people who are unrepresented just through the audience. I mean, I, I never thought that we would see, I think today it's great. Yeah. It's weird to see so many films in the last couple of years about uh, women and people of color. I mean, it's like this year, particularly, I see there's, boy, a lot of really good films out there uh, mm -hmm. that would uh, make the film that I saw back in 1965, Nothing But a Man, seem so, small because that was the only film at that time and now we see yeah. maybe dozens of films about uh, a couple <laughs> you know uh, uh, courting each other and I was you know you can't even count on the two hands at least for this year how many good films with name you know actors and actresses doing this so yeah. I you know it's been great progress I mean I didn't contribute to this I mean this has been the the, the force of, I guess, of how society has evolved and hopefully yeah. will bring about change. But, you know, that's been one change is at least we see di different images portrayed on the screen. Yeah. I, I know it's been a long time in the making, but this, you know, the changes we see in uh, Hollywood today, um, you know, has really only come about since this initiative uh, yeah. by the Academy in the last five years, I would say. So yeah. um, it's good to, you know, to see that happen. And I have to say that I hate to use the term Hollywood because Hollywood is not a place. It's because I, I think so many people think that, oh, well, Hollywood, still, you know, especially those that don't work in, in the film business or, yeah. or live in Hollywood, it's not a physical place. It doesn't because even have a zip code. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hollywood is Atlanta. Hollywood is, it was in North Carolina. It, I, mean, learned, I, was, I learned I learned that when I moved out here because I I was you know the, you, there's the area people ho, there is an area that's you know how what Hollywood is which is nothing to do with movie making it's actually a terrible place to live for those who don't know don't ever go to Hollywood and Island it's awful but uh, <laughs> it's you know but when you actually like I learned that when I moved out here when you type in Hollywood on your phone of like places in the area it says do you want to go to North Hollywood you can't yeah. actually navigate to Hollywood you can navigate to Hollywood Boulevard you can navigate yeah. to North Hollywood but there is yeah. no actual physical place you can go to that is Hollywood. Yeah, the Hollywood so find isn't actually in Hollywood. It's in- So I'll just explain to the audience that when I say Hollywood, I'm talking about, I guess, the the, 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 the financing, decision-making machinery, yeah. you know, which these days is multinational because, you know, when you look at any of the credits of films today, whether they're English speaking films or uh, Hindu, uh, you know, Hindi speaking films, and you look at all the entities of all the different um, based in, uh, companies in different countries, you realize it's, it's really a global phenomenon. And maybe Hollywood happens to be the place where a couple of the actors, the people in front of the camera, you know, uh, might live. But um, basically, it's not uh, just one place. No, it's 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 the I, I tend to I tend to to go with the industry as my catch-all. Right. So okay. we can use we can use that. Uh, that'll be a little more a little a little easier. Uh, because I'm with you. I I've I've 
I've got, I've tried to get myself away from using it. I've caught myself using it a lot more because it's easy. It's simple. And it's, I it's know it's easy. You know, when we talk about politics or the oh, dysfunction, yeah. of government, it was in Washington, you know, but you know, exactly. it's not you don't really Washington. Know. Yeah. Right. But at the end of the day, I've actually become more concerned with specificity of language because you create certain things. You create this idea of Hollywood, and then you get a whole bunch of people who want to point their finger at Los Angeles and go, you guys out there doing yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah. And the reality yeah. is, it's like, why are you, why is everyone getting mad at my city? We didn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not. You know, when I get to the later part, but my first three feature films that I worked on, The Conversation, One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest, and Star Wars, were all created in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, and nothing yeah. to do with Hollywood. In fact, it was in reaction to Hollywood that these mm -hmm. were done. And you know, and Scorsese, all his early films were done out of New York, and they still are. So you know, and there's Rich Linklater. You know, all his early films were done out of Austin, and yeah. um, Tyler Perry. You know, he works out of Atlanta. So we're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, no, it's true. It's it really, and see, and it has been clearly, you know, even since then. Most, most, most of my audience is probably very familiar about, you know, Lucas, Lucas, and Lucasfilm doing most of their work up in, in the Bay Area, uh, and that being his homeland. But I don't think people realize that that is the case for a lot of big filmmakers over the years. Have always sort of wanted to make home base wherever home is uh, to them, and bring it in here. And nowadays too, you know, just with. Uh, cities, different cities will give different benefits, different tax cuts. That's why Atlanta's been the hot zone lately. Philadelphia used to be a big hub until some idiot there decided to get rid of all the uh, arts uh, incentives. But yeah, it's... It, well, and we don't even need a base. I mean, when you look at all the tools we have, the mobile tools that we have, any of your audience who are storytellers that want to tell their story on film, you can just use your phone. Yeah. You know? You oh, know, yeah. and you can edit on your laptop and you can make a really great movie. I've had a, I, I was just doing a, a stream with a, a, the rookie critic, who's this wonderful guy who lives up in, in Washington, his young, young guy uh, who wants to be a director. And so right now he's just, he doesn't have a, other people he knows who, who do a lot of film. Uh, so he shoots, he'll sh do jump cuts and uh, trick shooting to make himself the character in every shot if he needs to or stop motion and all this stuff and it's really great but we were talking and he was saying yeah I need to work on these things with editing and those things with editing and I'm really not great and it's really not my thing but I really should learn it because I got to do it and I said no you don't I said yes it's good to edit and know how to do it and be able to tell the story you want to do but go online there are there are hundreds of people who are very very good at what they do willing to do this for you for free to put on their resume go online you can send this out to anywhere in the world and get it back probably in a couple of days done 10 times better than you will ever be able to do because it's being done by someone who wants to be an editor. You don't have to know them. You don't have to be in the same city as them. Well, but you know, when I started, when we're talking about in the 1960s now, um, it was 16 millimeter film was the way to go. And you really need machines and you need splicers. You really need, it was really a craft where you're handling things, you know? Um, and 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 you and needed uh, people to help you in a way. I mean, it was just hard to do by yourself. Yeah. And because you needed labs and you needed, you know, a lot of uh, auxiliary support. Yeah. And um, anyway, yeah. that that was how I got started and answered. You know, or circling back around to your <laughs> initial question. Um, yeah. yeah. How did I go from law school to working on Star Wars? Well, I started in documentaries. And uh, I just had, a, I think, kind of simple or simplistic, um, you know, goal was I just want to learn how to do this and to tell stories to reach people that don't have a voice and, and, and want to see people like them on the screen. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, obviously diving into your first official Hollywood editing job is uh, part two, but I... Uh, was there were there any nuggets prior to there where you thought editing was the thing, where there the editing bug or the actual cutting it up and you know when did that when did where does that start to plant its seed? So it was on this film uh, about the redwoods, and uh, it was, the title is the redwoods. Um, you know, prior to that, um, uh, when I worked in news, editing was to. Uh, uh, cut a shot to the length of the news report. So, for instance, you know, I, I worked, for, <laughs> uh, I would shoot um, footage for the six o'clock news, and then they would have like a minute slot for this story and a two minutes for this. 
and then uh, editing to me was running the 60 millimeter film uh, through a timer that would tell me, oh, this, you know, if, you, if, I, if I cut it here, it's uh, 12 seconds long. If I cut it here, it's five seconds long. So I would just have to do the arithmetic of finding enough shots to fill out the 60 seconds. <laughs> and it wasn't about montage, you know, it wasn't about juxtaposition of images. Mm -hmm. So it was the Redwoods that, again, for me, I had another mentor. I mean, I, I've been so fortunate uh, to have mentors. And I think that any of the people in your audience who are, are aspiring to be filmmakers, look for the mentors that can help you. But um, the uh, director of uh, the Redwoods uh, had been a film teacher at USC. So... He saw in me a willing student, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to, uh, because I had shot the whole thing, he said, uh, do you want to work in the editing room with me, with him? So I did, and on the Moviola, as I started to run you know, the, the shots through there and then splice them together, and I just thought, you know, I had never heard of Eisenstein. I didn't know about juxtaposition. I didn't know about you know, what it would mean if you juxtapose these two shots together. And when I started doing that of, say, take a, a simple example of cross-cutting uh, between uh, virgin trees uh, standing in the fog and cross-cutting that with bulldozers, you know, coming down the boat. I'm like, oh, that means something. Mm -hmm. So um, to me, uh, learning about uh, how I could uh, change the meaning of an image and then by the duration of the image, you know, it made all the difference in what story I was telling. Yeah. So uh, that was, to me, I, I started to lean that way that, you know, I find this much more fascinating than trying to capture um, the image because in a way, I'm, I guess I, I'm a little lazy because being a cameraman means you have to get up really early in the morning. <laughs> So you get up at 4 a.m., you know, and you got to be on site before the sun comes up, you know, so you could capture this shot. And it's cold, you know, and you have to travel and you have to stay in these little crappy motels, you know, and, and rent <laughs> these cars and go out to places and, you know, and it, it's cold, it's wet, and it's, I don't know. And you, anyway, I found, I, I like the editing room. You have air conditioning, you know, <laughs> you carpet. You know, and and you can you can drink coffee, and, and and at that time I used to smoke cigarettes, so you can smoke cigarettes, and then you know mess around with reels and film and, and splice together stuff, and then you can redo things. That's what I liked about it. Was I mean, it, this was before digital editing, uh, where if if you wanted to redo a splice, you could actually take apart a splice by having to undo the tape that held together the pieces of film together. So, so anyway, can I just uh, uh, command Z. <laughs> oh yeah, right. It was it was more arduous. It was much more arduous to undo mistakes. But anyway, it it um, it seduced me into uh, wanting to be that more than uh, being a, a cameraman. Although I um, continued to work for the next I don't know seven, five or six years as being a freelance cameraman. Because in, in certain ways it was exciting too, because you get to go places oh, yeah. that I wouldn't have gone, you know, working in the editing room. Uh, so anyway, I got made the, the turn on the conversation because the conversation was the first movie actually I got to work on solely as an editor and not have to, um, you know, uh, say in documentaries, I would shoot the stuff and then edit too. There you go. And so if you guys want to hear us talk more about the conversation, you guys are going to have to tune in next week for part two. This has been part one. We've had a blast talking to Richard about we, by we, I mean I, me, and uh, I guess the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, <laughs> all about how we got to start into editing, uh, which I love, as you know, I lost my mind over earlier, how exciting I, I always find it to hear the stories of you just, you, you were on your path, you doing the thing, keeping your head down, walking the walk. And then one day you said, fuck it and chased your dreams. That's, I love it. Um, and of course, next week when we dive into 
the 1970s and feature films, you guys know what's in store then. So we'll have all of the uh, Star Wars in there as well, as well as some of your questions at the end there. So thank you guys, everyone for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Follow me in all of the places. The links and descriptions are down below and tune in for more next week. God, I guess I should do my God Empress out. <laughs> That's my, my, the way I always end my things. I go, God Empress out and then just fall. <laughs>